Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Audrey Stewart, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am very excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Clea Simon discussing her new book, Hold Me Down. She's joined tonight in conversation by Caroline Levitt. Through good times and bad, Harvard Bookstore will continue to bring authors and their work to our virtual community. Our fall season is in full swing, and you don't want to miss out on our lineup. Make sure to check out our event schedule on harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk, go to the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. If you'd like to purchase a copy of Hold Me Down, there will be a link in the chat where you can purchase. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you. There will also be a link for donation in the chat if you would like to give additional support to Harvard Bookstore. Without your continued support and patronage, this virtual series wouldn't be possible. Thank you again for tuning in in support of our authors, our incredible booksellers, and our landmark independent bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support, especially now. And as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as we can. So thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. We also have closed captioning options. If you would like to turn those on, click on the closed captioning button on your screen. Now I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. A former journalist, Clea Simon is the Boston Globe best-selling author of three nonfiction books and 29 mysteries. She's a very busy woman. While most of these, like A Cat on the Chase, are cat cozies or amateur sleuth, she also writes darker crime fiction, like the rock and roll mystery World Enough, named a must read by the Massachusetts Book Awards. She is joined by Caroline Levitt. Caroline is the New York Times bestselling author of 10 novels, including With or Without You. A book critic for People and AARP, she runs a blog called Runs in the Family for Psychology to get Today and teaches novel writing at UCLA Writers Program Extension. Tonight, they're discussing Hold Me Down. The psychological suspense novel focuses on PTSD and recovery all while set in the music world. Nina McLaughlin called Hold Me Down a propulsive new thriller, adding in electric prose, Simon conjures the rock and roll world, its drink, drugs, and band dynamics, and the twin seductresses of excess and success as she makes a penetrating portrait of friendship. And on that note of high praise, I'll turn things over to our speakers. Clea, Caroline, thank you so much for joining us tonight. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Audrey. Thank you so, so much, Audrey. And I'm delighted to be here with Clea Simon. I've known Clea for a million years. We actually first met in the early days of the internet on a book forum. And I had just read Clea's book, Fatherless Women, which was a really important book to me because I'm a fatherless woman. And, I, and uh, we became friends. I have to say that this book, Hold Me Down, I feel it's your best book ever. I absolutely love it. It's very, very different from all your other books. It's gritty. It's powerful. It's, I believe I said, I probably said this in my blurb, that it's like a punch to the heart. But it is. And I you mean did. that Thank in you. the best of all possible ways. So I want to tell everybody out there listening that Clea and I are going to be talking until probably around 7.35 or 7.40. And then if you have questions, please put them in the chat and I'll read them out loud and Clay will be delighted to talk with you about it. So before I pepper you with questions, Clea, would you like to do a short reading to give everybody a taste of this incredible book? Oh, oh wait, and before you do, let me just tell everybody <laughs> what the book is about. Sorry. Huh? Gal River was a rock star, but that was 20 years ago. And as Hold Me Down enter, it begins, she's back in Boston playing a big stage for the first time in years. It's a memorial concert for her late drummer and best friend Amy, who co-founded the band with her. But as she's playing, she sees or thinks she sees a face from the past, which of course unsettles her greatly. The next day she hears that that person was murdered and Amy's widower Walter was arrested. When Walter chooses not to fight the charge, Gal is compelled to get involved, not only to save her friend, but to understand why for a moment moment there she thought it should have been me an investigation that leads her back into her old wild 
rock star days. So read for us, Cleo. <laughs> Thank you. I will. But first, I have to say, I love your velvet top because um, you and I were talking about velvet because we're, we're both kind of velvet junkies. And yes, that's, that's a winner. <laughs> so mine is just black. It doesn't have that that great gloss that yours has. <laughs> But we both go with the cover. So. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We did that. We did not coordinate. So if you'll excuse me, um, I'm actually going to read from a book rather than reading from the screen, as as if we were actually within Harvard Bookstore. Okay. Thank you, uh, Caroline. Thank you, Audrey, for the, those wonderful introductions. Um, this is the opening to Hold Me Down. Ten songs in, and she stumbles, her tongue tangled in a lyric she should have down by heart. So much for hubris, Gal tells herself, struggling to get back in sync, to get back on the beat, fingers moving one, two, one, two over the thick bass strings. So much for aging. Lena, her guitarist, looks over. The slight rise of her eyebrows is eloquent as the fill she plays to cover. She's fast, all metal and speed still. And she hangs on that last barb note, stretching it out as she waits for the high sign, the cue from Gal. A stadium move, but it has the crowd cheering. It's been years since Lena's had to do that, Gal realizes, chagrined. It's been years, period. In response, Gal grabs the mic stand, pulling it closer with her left hand while her right keeps the rhythm thrumming away on the open E. The move centers her. She stands a little straighter and then she's back, belting out the chorus she knows as well as the tattoo on her wrist in F clef, faded blue, as the song pours out of her, the words coming easily now, winding up to the hook, the line with the hiccup, one extra beat that makes the rhyme different, makes it stand out. She sees that now feels the crowd inhale in anticipation as she rounds into the chorus for the reprises, once again in time with Lena and Bobby Joe. She's learned a lot about songwriting in the last 20 years, knows the tricks that turn a pop progression into an earworm, wields them at will when she sits down at the piano or tries to anyway. She hasn't had a hit like this one written by instinct since then, but she's done all right. And tonight, well, tonight is all about revisiting the past. A brief pause between numbers. Lena's changing guitars, Barry acting as her tech as he runs out with the Strat. Gal takes a moment to eye the crowd, really check them out before Bobby Joe counts off the beat. She doesn't need the set list, none of them do. They're not doing anything new tonight and the progression is obvious, one song to the next. She hears the tick, tick, tick of Bobby's sticks and the feedback, feedback begins to growl. Breathing deep from the belly, she steps back up to the mic stand and once more begins to sing. It shouldn't be automatic, not tonight, and certainly not after that memory slip. Still, Gal can't help drifting. Maybe it's the crowd. Too many familiar faces missing, too many gone for good. Maybe it's the venue. After years of smaller clubs, coffee houses mostly, she's forgotten how far back the ballroom goes. Its rear corners shrouded in darkness. The house lights are down and she can guess how she looks, how the band looks from out there. So bold and so bright. Older, sure, but tough with it. Initiates, blooded in ways they can only imagine. What those upturned faces don't suspect is how much is visible from up here. She can see almost everything from the stage and back into those dark corners. And in the touring years, she did, fucking, fighting. The crowd as oblivious of her gaze as they are connected to her, as if she were, in fact, some kind of dispassionate God. The way they want her up here, high above them, the power of it, pure sex drawing them to her still, the control. She closes her eyes then, tells herself she wants to concentrate, to be in the moment for this moment and for this number and the one that comes after, the big climax, Amy's song. The reason they're all here tonight. Bobby Joe plays the opening role, not Amy, who is, but steady with the hi-hat offsetting the big bass beat and then it's time. Gal waits for the surge of emotion that comes when she sings her old friend's lyrics. A different kind of love, but it's got me. It always takes her hard, leaving her wired and jagged after. Different, sure, but right. Memories of touring, of doing these songs night after night, of Amy, a monster on the set, her shoulders mounted with muscle, Lena to her right, the women who came before came after, musicians and mates all blending together now. That must be why her mind is playing tricks on her, why she would forget the words to hold me down, her own breakthrough song, the one that made the band, why she would think for a moment that she saw a face, his face, shining up, pale and sweat slick from the middle of the heaving crowd. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, you and I have talked before about our wild younger days in Boston and Cambridge with much hilarity. So I wanted to know about why did you set this book in the rock world and what research did you do for it besides memories? 
Uh, that's a big question. Thank you, Caroline. Um, <laughs> there, I, I'm, I'm going to approach it on a couple of levels. One, the rock world um, is a contained world. So as a writer, it's great because you've got all these these characters who are interacting and you know rubbing off each other and it, it's a set of characters. And as a crime fiction writer, that's sort of a, you know, a classic. It's like if I was writing another cozy, this could be like an English village or you know a, a manor or something. Instead, okay, it's like the basement clubs and stuff. Um, and and so it's just sort of a great setting. It's a great little world to study. Plus, as as you said, um, you know this is a world I know well for a lot of years. I was a rock critic, so this was my third place. This was, uh, you know, this is where I went that wasn't home or my day job. Um, and also, I, I think it's sort of interesting to me. Um, the rock world is is still obsessed with youth, obsessed with the now, but because I'm dealing with with music and and songs that were recorded, um, it, it, in a way, you've got a time capsule. So you've got this music. And you have the, that was that was now then, um, right. and you have now, um, and so there's a lot of tension in there, and also between that tension, um, you know, you you get to to plant plant you know clues or exposition. Um, I'm sorry, did did you want me to talk about research? You asked. I don't want to keep going on. Yeah, I just yeah, I wanted to know. Yeah, sure. besides, like, did you talk to people to see how things had changed, or did you go back and look at all your diaries and all your photos? <laughs> Um, I'm sure, well, actually, I don't know if things have changed, but, but I don't, that, I, you know, Gal was a rock star back then, so she hasn't been in the clubs, so, so I don't have to go to the clubs, um, but I did talk to a lot of people, um, and, you know, being a critic meant I was at a lot of shows, but also, you know, we, we were a community, we were a wild, so, a, a world, so I knew radio people and, you know, record company reps, so we all hung out, so it wasn't just like going to the shows, it was going to the stations, you know, when a band's doing the interview and everyone's hanging out beforehand or, or, or the record store where they're doing, they're dropping in for 15 minutes and then you all get back in the car with the, you know, the label rep and you drive off someplace. Um, and it was really fun. I, I talked to, I did talk to a lot of people there and I, I did talk to some people, some of whom I thank and some of whom it, for various reasons want to remain anonymous who, um, had levels of fame that I never had. I mean, I did play in bands as well, but I talked to some people who were, you know, bona fide rock stars um, to get some of the details. And it's things that I did remember, like the smell of the clubs and the smell of a van when basically, you know, five people have been living in it for a week, but also stuff that I didn't necessarily know, like that the tour bus drivers carry guns because of course they do, because it's a cash business and they're on the move. Um, and, and these details sort of came up, they were, they were fun for me. They came up in interesting ways, like my friend Lisa, I hope is here tonight, um, who sang with a band called Vision Thing, just sort of offhanded uh, mentioned to me that something that you heard in that intro, uh, that from up on stage, you can really see very far back. Um, and, and you don't think that people see that. Um, and so I got to use that with Gal, and, and this frequently now happens with Gal. Throughout the book, she sees or she thinks she sees something, a drunk woman, maybe an interaction between two people. And, and that might be real because it's a, you know, a common enough occurrence or it might be something else. We're not really sure. So the book goes back and forth in time a lot. And yeah. sometimes we wonder if Gal is actually an unreliable narrator. So that's two things going on at the same time. I wanted to know if you could talk about that because I find that really interesting, both as a writer and as a reader. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, unreliable narrators, especially in crime fiction are, are kind of hot. And and Gal is not an unreliable narrator in, in the Gone Girl sense. She's not lying to you. I mean, this is, you know, we're gonna be, get writer here. Um, this is close third person. So we're seeing things sort of as Gal sees them. Um, so she's telling us the truth as she sees it. Right. Um, but um, one of the things that I like to write about in, in this book um, and in World Enough to some extent is the unreliability of memory. Um, and it, you know, it can be changed by, you know, by nostalgia or, or, or guilt or denial. And Gal is a survivor. And so that means she's, she's been through, through some things and, um, you know, and, and, and things, th those things have changed her. Um, so I, I like to think it, this is, you know, theoretically a mystery and there is a murder in it, um, but it's, it's really two mysteries. It's the mystery of um, who killed the person who gets killed and, and why 
you know, why won't Walter defend himself, um, Amy's widower defend himself, but it's also the mystery of, of how Gal got from who she was, who, you know, who we see in the flashbacks to who she is now, which is a very different person. Let's talk about that, that bit with memory a little bit more, because I don't want to give anything away, but there's a lot in the book that's so profound and so powerful about PTSD, trauma, and sexual assault. And one of the things about PTSD is that, of course, the memories reemerge and they're different, but you still feel, but the feelings you have are not different. I thought that was really fascinating. Can you talk about that? Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, I will. Um, well, as I said, Gal is is damaged, but she's a survivor, as am I. Um, and one of the things I've realized in my own life is that if you survive really any kind of trauma, um, it shapes you. And, you know, ideally you can go on and still live a, you know, a wonderful full life. But it's slightly different than the life you would have been living if you hadn't been through that. Um, it, it's like it's like your lens is ever so slightly warped. And, you know, so you're, you were going this way and now you're going, eh, um, or, eh, and, um, and maybe you see things differently and, and maybe you can see things clearly, but maybe that lens is warped too. I, I mean, that's one of the reasons that I, that I do the flashbacks in the time, because there are, there are flashbacks, but it's really three different gals we see. And the first is the gal who was, when she's first starting out and she's, she's very shy and, um, and scared and she's desperate to break through but she's she's got stage fright and she she just can't get at the core of who she is and we learn a little about her family um and then we see gal when she was at her rock star height when she was you know just wild and out of control and now we see her now when she's you know sober and she's living a responsible life but she's not writing, you know, as she alludes in that beginning. Um, and so between those three, I, have, I hope that sets up the mystery of, of what happened. How did, how did that one woman go through all these three different stages? And, you know, it's, it is that, that just sort of slight warping, that slight recentering of, yeah, of trauma. It changes you. It changes you. So I wanted to talk about the song, gal songs because the songs she wrote when she wrote them and how she feels about them now when she rehears them. Um, tell us about that. Sure, thank you. Um, gal songs like Hold Me Down, when, which as she says in that opening, she, she's not writing them anymore. I, I love the songs because they serve as touchstones uh, for the reader as well as for Gal. And they're also, you know, not really giving anything away here. They're, they're uh, clues to the reader as to what's going on to Gal. Because there, there are things that she crafted at a certain point, but now she's looking back on. Um, I mean, take the song, it's not, it's not Hold Me Down, but another song that she writes that she talks about. Um, we see her when she's first writing it and she's, you know, nervous. And this is when the labels are beginning to come around. She's, and she's just desperate to be, for it to be good. So she, she really crafts it. Um, she puts in a bridge and she, you know, she makes it really, you know, she tries to make it a whole package. But then we look back at when Gal was at her most out of control. And at that point, she, you know, just sort of glosses over the bridge. She says, oh, that was, that's just a bit of fussiness. She doesn't need that. You know, and, and, you know, and then now looking back on it, she, she can't, she, she can't do anything about this. She can't do anything like this. Um, so you have these songs and, and they're gal and they're outside of gal. So you get to see gal looking back at a part of herself, but you also get to see sort of as a reality check, maybe different people reacting. And I'm not saying that any one outsider has, you know, the entire truth, but you see the record label suits reacting to the songs. Right. You see the audience, react, but you, and you also see her bandmates and they, they might be hearing something then different than, than gal intended. You know, they're, they're just sort of, they're out there. They're, they're little, they're little time capsules floating around. So Gal, Gal is blocked um, both in her, some of her memories about what happened and what is happening now, and also just in her whole process of creating. So I wanted to, I, this is a two part question. First, I wanted to know what's going on with that with Gal. And then I wanted you to talk about your creative experience. Do you get blocked? What do you do when you're blocked? What do you think it means for you as opposed to what it means for Gal? Uh, well, it's easier to deal with Gal's because I, I think I know her a little better. 
Uh, so I, I can talk a little about that, but not too much because that, of course, is the central mystery of the book. What is going on with Gal? Uh, you know, she was blocked when when she was younger, and then she had a while a time of of wild creativity and just wild, you know, letting loose. And now she's blocked again. Um, and you have to ask, you know, what's blocking her? And you know, is it the same thing? Is it something different? And how do you work through that? And the way you work through that is to some extent, it's, you have to figure out what is what is blocking you. And often what is blocking you is something that you are refusing to deal with. Um, yes, I like that. That's, that's yeah, that's I don't want to say more than that. <laughs> um, and for myself, uh, wow. Um, I take my inspiration um, from, um, you know, the, the great pub rocker, Nick Lowe, who said, bash it out now, tart it up later. <laughs> Um, basically, you, you, you and I talk about this a lot. We always um, say that to each other, yeah. You, we, you give yourself permission when you're writing your first draft to write horribly, you know, right. just get something on the page. Right. Um, and, and you and I have talked about this, but it's, you go for what, what the heat is. I mean, it's, it's like a couple of people have asked me like, you know, gee, you've done cozies and now you're doing this and you're gonna go back to cozies. Um, I, I hope to go back to cozies. They're really fun, they're really comforting. But this book just wanted to be written because it it was, you know, it was the sore tooth that I wanted to bother. And, you know, and, and you want to see what's behind it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, so so Gal discovering what's going on was me discovering what was going on as well. I, I actually remember, you know, when you started writing this book and you emailed me and you said, I'm really scared. And I remember thinking, this is good. This is going to be really, really good. So how terrifying was it to leave like you know how to write a great cozy you know how to write a great cat book and here's a book about something darker and grittier how, how did you keep yourself pushing through it um i have to say there is a cat in this book it's it's my doff of the of the cap or doff of the cat to my cozy people and she's she's off stage her name is Honey. I think her name is Honey. And she's mentioned like somewhere in the middle, like twice. Um, but um, it was scary to do this. Uh, it really was, it's, it's sort of, um, you know, it's the bash it out now, tar it up later. I, I, I like to think of it as um, like slicing the top of your head off. You know, the, 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 the critical editing part of your head. You just, you know, when that starts acting up, you have to just drink more coffee or go for a run or take a hot shower. Um, so, yeah, this, this was scary for me. I, and, and thank you very much for encouraging me. We, Caroline, I really do talk about these things a lot. Um, once I got into it, I got into that whole, I don't know, fugue state thing where it just, right. um, it just needed to be written and, you know, and, and I would just write. Um, I, I think it was more the idea of like, what is this going to be? It's like, if I could, if I could not think about what is this going to be, uh, who is going to read this? you know, will this, will this work? You know, th those are all, you know, th those are the inspiration killers. I, we just watched Dune, so I think, you know, fear is the mind killer. Uh, <laughs> right, right. Okay, so um, I want to tell people again, if you have questions for Clea, go to the Q&A chat, the Q&A notice, that's not the chat, the Q&A that's on the bottom of your screen and write them in. And before we take the questions, we're going to have Clea, would you read another little passage for us, please? Uh, I would love to. Thank you. Um, I realized, by the way, when I picked the segment to read that it actually, um, it, it reprises some of um, what I talk about in the opening. And um, the, I like to think the book isn't that repetitive, but, but there are themes. So um, you'll hear some of that here. Uh, this is a shorter segment. This is uh, around page 58, 59. Um, and it's, it's after the concert and um, it, all, you know, all hell hasn't broken loose yet. We don't know about uh, you know, the person who's died. Walter hasn't been arrested. Um, thank you. Um, but um, it, it's, it, she's in Walter's house, Amy's old apartment, uh, old condo. Um, and she's, going, she's sorting through the billing. And I hope this will give you a sense of some of the time uh, lapse. Uh, and Russ is her you know, sometime boyfriend who's she's left back upstate New York. And it's, she's just come off a memory of the band. Another world a lifetime ago. She opens her eyes to the papers before her. Hospital bills, a few marked paid. The donation receipt for the wheelchair. A letter from the hospice, polite but routine. Gal's a writer of a sort. 
She recognizes the rhythms of someone used to hitting their beats, kind, but a bit formulaic, in its expression of sympathy, the conclusion a little rote, tying up two thirds down the page like a three minute song designed for radio play. Not that her own writing's much better these days. No, she stops herself, hands flat on the desk. She's not even this good. Sobriety calls for honesty. And while she's not a 12 stepper, she accepts the basic principles. She can't do it, not like she used to. Pulling something out of herself that she didn't even know was in there, working a line into a hook, the words fitting the music that just kept coming. Whether that was because the booze gave her something or more likely because the years of hard living took it away, she may never know. She can recognize a cliche, a worn set of changes designed as an earworm, but she can't even do those anymore. And the brilliance, another breath, a deep inhale. That's what Russ would never understand. It was magic in its way, being up there on stage, not just the crowd though, yeah, to have them staring, wanting at her mercy was a rush like no other. More than that, it was the music itself, like lava flowing through her, relentless, hot. And out of control, sure. Her music shaped who she was on stage and off, but to feel that power again, she'd give up a lot to get that back, all of it maybe if she could. She rubs her thumb over the F clef on her fist, on her wrist, a reminder faded now of what she had, the cost. Russ has caught her a few times fooling around with her guitar. Play me something, he says, if he's in the mood. The last time, last week before she came down here, he actually lay at her feet, his legs crossed at the ankle and his head resting on his hands. I don't usually play lullabies. She'd done her best to growl. The man was cute and he knew it. She needed to keep him in his place. Play me something new. He'd looked up at her, his voice teasing. She's tried. He probably didn't know, but she'd been trying for weeks by then. Blues for Amy, she'd been thinking of calling it, playing around with a simple melody since she'd gotten the news. The hook wasn't bad, as far as she could tell. It wasn't something she'd used before nor cribbed from a half-remembered favorite on the radio, but it wasn't what she wanted which she almost half heard in the back of her mind, mournful but full of life, a tribute she could bring to the benefit, a gift for Walter and for Camille that would have her joy, but also anger, something raw and real. Fuck off, she'd kicked at Russ and stood. I've got the pack. It's great, it's just great. You have a lot of questions, so let's get two of them. The first one is from Colleen Mohide. Thank you, Colleen. What are the challenges to writing about music, trying to make something alive that the reader can't hear? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, that is a good question. She says, repeating it um, to stall for a second. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> writing about music, you know, they, they famously say writing about music is like dancing about architecture. Um, Cause of course, writing about any non-narrative art uh, is, is um, you're writing about something that can't necessarily be articulated in words. I mean, that's if, if it could be, then we wouldn't have music. It's or like, um, you know, like in Caroline's With or Without You, she has Stella, uh, who's, a, who's a painter. <laughs> I've been waiting to get that in there. I have this right here. Um, and, um, you know, so it, it, to write about that, it's, um, you have to really go into the senses of it. You know, what does something feel like? Um, what is something, you know, even the, the smell or the, I mean, that's why I have, you know, I, I picked up my bass. And I'd forgotten how heavy it was, um, just to have the, the, the heft of it, the weight of it, and to feel the strings. Um, but also writing about music is, it's like, it's like writing about writing. So it's a chance to sort of channel that and explain, um, you know, what it, what it feels like to create something. Um, I, I think the key, if you're writing about, well, if you're writing about music, um, when I was a music critic, what I always wanted to do, what I tried to do, uh, was one to sort of have the history, to have the knowledge so that it, at the very least you're giving people something, you're, you're giving them a, you know, a sense of what, what they're really hearing, um, you know, and with Gal, it's, you know, what she's actually playing. It's not, you know, all vague. It's like, no, she's playing, this is the beat, this is the, what the drums are doing, this is what the bass is doing. Um, and, but at the same time, to try to connect with the emotion of the moment mm -hmm. and to articulate it in words. Um, which I don't know. I, I don't know if I do it well, but that's that's the goal. Oh, I think you did it really well. I mean, that was one of the Thank things you. that I loved about the book. You did it really well. Colleen has another question for you. What is the club world in Boston like now, and how does it compare to when you were working in the clubs? Oh uh, well, I have not <laughs> been in a. Well, that's not true. I went to I went to a club in early July, I guess, before before Delta. Um, uh, my husband and I went to um, a local bar where um, 
uh, Dennis Brennan, who's a fantastic Boston musician, shout out to Dennis Brennan, Google him, uh, was playing. And oh my God, I mean, most of the crowd there was 50 plus. Um, and we were all unmasked and it was wonderful. And he was wonderful. And, and it was just amazing. But, you know, and as walking home, my husband and I were going, gee, maybe we should have worn masks. We were fine. Um, I, I don't know what the club scene is for younger people now. I do have a lot of friends who are still going out to hear music. And um, right now things are weird. I mean, people are, you know, they're masked indoors or everyone's trying to play outdoors, which, you know, until, ah, that's my cat scratching at her scratching toes. Oh, um, I love it. Great acoustics. <laughs> this um, little acoustics. Uh, so I, I don't really know. Um, I guess that's the, the short answer is I don't really know. But for that one night in probably the first week in July that we were at Sally O's listening to Dennis Brennan, it was wonderful. We have a question from Lloyd Schwartz. He said, bravo. Hi, Lloyd. What are the differences between writing a serious novel or a cozy? Is one really harder than another? If so, in what way? And is one more fun than the other? That's an interesting question. Yes. <laughs> um, Lloyd, you're a poet, so you, you should know. I, all writing is, you know, what, what did Yates say? A line will take us hours maybe, but if it seems more than a moment's thought, our stitching and unstitching is for naught. Um, writing cozies, it's a, different, um, it's a different set of muscles because you want to be light, you want to be funny. Um, so it has to be, you know, as, as frothy as sea foam um, and still, I, you know, ideally have some emotional connection. Uh, this, um, it was like, wow, I can, I can have my characters talking like real people do, you know, when, when gal says, fuck you, you know, it's like, wow, she can do that. Um, right now I'm in this world. So I'm finding this world more, um, satisfying and, and more engaging and deeper. Um, but when I'm in my cozy world, I love that. Um, I, I find they're just, I'm just very, I feel great affection for those. I don't think I feel affection for these. I, I, I love Gal and I respect her, but I, but my, you know, my, my Witch Cats of Cambridge series, I, I just feel, I just, I just want to cozy up. There's a reason they're called cozies. I just, you know, I want to live with them. I don't know if I want to live with Gal. I, I don't know if that answered your question. That's interesting. That's really interesting, especially during the pandemic. I could see why you'd want to be in the cozy world. Yes. More than in the nitty gritty dark world. Okay, we have a question from the fantastically named Nell Pepper. I love that name. Okay, was Gal or were her bandmates inspired by any specific musicians? And if so, who? Um, a lot, and I don't, Nell, I don't know you. Um, a, a lot of people I've spoken to here who I do know from the scene, and maybe you are one of them and we just have not met yet. Uh, friends we have not yet met yet. Um, None of the people or the places are specifically like based on anybody. Um, some of Gal's experiences, well, they're all based on real people. And I was inspired by, um, by, an, by an incident with Chrissy Hind of The Pretenders. I mean, I guess in my mind, I sort of see her as a combo of, you know, she's, she's got some Joan Jett, she's got some Chrissy Hind, she's got, uh, what was her name? Chrissy Afflet of The Divinals. Um, you know, this Slater Kinney, there's that kind of just, you know, raw, okay. get out of yourself. Um, but Chrissy Hind, the, spoiler alert, I'm sort of giving something away here, which you probably have figured out anyway. Um, a, a bunch of years ago, and this is, I think, when I was beginning to write about my own experience with, with uh, trauma, um, I, there were two experiences that happened back to back. Uh, one was that I saw Chrissy Hind on... Um, on a TV show, I think it was the Stephen, Stephen Colbert late, late show, whatever. Um, and she was, she was acting really oddly. She was flirting and, and, and sort of being, she was coming on to Stephen, the host, in a way that was really uncomfortable. Um, he looked uncomfortable. It, it, was, it was just weird. And it just, it, it made me uncomfortable for her. Um, and then soon after that, her memoir came out where she, in which she talked about, um, she, and she's older than I am, so she's in her 60s. Um, and she talked about at the age of like 20 or 21, um, being gang raped by a gang of, of bikers. And Jesus. I'm, I'm serious. And, and this woman who's now 40 years old, at least later, um, talked about how she blamed herself and it was her own fault. 
whoa. And all I could think was, well, you know, when you survive trauma, sometimes it is easier to take responsibility than to, I mean, psychologically, than to admit that you had no control. It's like that, that is so terrifying on a, you know, on, on an existential level that it's preferable to say, I chose that. It's, you know, at some level, I chose that. It was my mistake that made that happen. Not, I had no control. Um, and some of the ways that plays out, you know, it, it, you know, like I said, things like that warp a little bit who you are and it can warp your view of sex. It can warp your view of, of gender relations. And I felt like that, so that was something that I, I used, but it's, you know, it, it's also something that I know from my own life um, to a much lesser degree, but it's something that I know from my own life and that I, I drew on um, and I, I recognize that. So there's some of, there's some of gal in that. Um, that's extraordinary. It's, yeah. it, that's all about the stories we tell ourselves about our lives and yes. that we come to believe. Yes. Well, that's, yeah. that's Gal's issue. It's not only solving the murder, but how did she get from here to there? And, and, and where right. does she go next? Michael Ferris has two questions for you. He says, Hi, Mike. you write so compellingly about the experience of being on stage. I was curious about the bands you've actually been in. By the way, this gives you a chance to name check the celebrity drummer we once jammed <laughs> with. Okay, that's the first question. I'll wait on the second one so you can. Um, well, uh, you mean like our band Wake Up Screaming, Mike? Uh, <laughs> with that's Conan O'Brien uh, on drums? <laughs> <laughs> um that you know none of the bands i have been in um have you know there have been the um uh we had a band that uh i'm 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 blanking on the name that was uh named because we were all critics uh playing in a band um i i have not been in any big bands i but um but i think that's that's what you meant i i honestly can't remember did did conan try out on guns on drums um he was younger than we were. Uh, he might have, I'm just guessing he did. I no longer actually remember because I can't think of any other celebrity who would have been. <laughs> he also wants to know if you're ever gonna return to nonfiction of any kind. I've never forgotten Madhouse and congrats on the latest. Thank you very much. Um, you know, who knows? I didn't think I was gonna write a, you know, a, a big dark psychological rock and roll novel either. Um, that said, I don't see doing it. Um, it's like John, my husband, Caroline, you know this, um, he started as a, a fiction writer and, you know, got his master's in that, you know, made a lot of writing short stories. Um, and then he sort of got seduced into journalism, um, because they publish you and they give you money. Um, and I sort of went the other way. I started off in journalism and nonfiction. I went into fiction and, um, I just remember that great feeling of, of relief when, um, cause with journalism, you, you know, you have to prove everything with nonfiction you have fact to check fact check everything and it's like you know like you don't believe that anything is real unless you find it you know at least three three people who can confirm it um it, they each have their own challenges like i, I remember telling john because he'd been there and gone the other way um this is great you can make shit up and he said aha <laughs> but you have to make shit up right so right. this That's is where right. i am now <laughs> <laughs> okay, Alan Brickman asks, did this book you give you a chance to deal with aspects of the rock world that you didn't or couldn't fit into world enough? Great question. Great question. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, the, you know, the, the, the rampant and wild uh, sexism and misogyny, um, which is not to say that that is not everywhere else. And, you know, right. ideally it's a little bit less, but in a situation where you also have lowered inhibitions, um, you know, drugs and alcohol. Um, and you also have people who are intentionally making themselves vulnerable, you know, as, as we do as writers, because they're, they're you know, rock deals with authenticity. Um, you know, you're supposed to, you know, if you do covers, you do it as a joke. If, if you're really creative, you're supposed to be, you know, tearing your guts out. So, you know, you've got people, largely young people thrown together, in this pressure cooker with a lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol, um, intentionally making themselves vulnerable, intentionally putting it all out there and, and trying to be uh, primal and real and, and you know, to bear them, their souls. Um, 
and that leads the way that opens up, you know, the world to a, a lot of, of abuse and both, you know, both substance abuse, which I, I dealt with to some extent in world enough. Um, but also the you know misogyny and, and just the the rampant sexism. I, some people out there probably know there's there's um there's these revelations coming out now about a band that I used to love out of Seattle and um, the leader of that band who it now turns out was you know a, 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 was a real I was the term that comes to mind is shit heel. Uh, he was a, a, a rapist and abuser for years and years. And it's like well I you know that, that's one band I'm not going to listen to anymore. Wow. Um, Joanna Schaffhausen asks, music plays such a rich role in this book. Did you have a play? Oh, I wanted to know that too. Did you have a playlist while writing it? Was there a song or album you thought of while bringing Gail and her band to life? Um, th there wasn't any one particular song. I did find that I was listening to a lot more sort of um, hard-edged uh, punk, post-punk garage while I was uh, writing. Um, you know, the, the bands that I named, like um, uh, Joan Jett and The Pretenders, I listened to a lot of Slater Kinney, um, who I think are, you know, they're, they're 10, 20 years later and a lot tougher than, than uh, you know, Gal and her unnamed band were. Um, so I don't think they would take the shit, but same idea. Um, Bikini Kill, um, to some extent, the Divinals. I think Chrissy Amphlett is, is more, more her than the Divinals. Uh, I said Bikini Kill. Um, I also found myself listening to a lot of, um, just you know, of male bands or or or, or mixed gender bands, uh, just for the sound of it. Um, uh, of course, now I'm blanking. Um, uh, uh, well, local bands like um, the Nervous Eaters um, or the Real Kids, uh, just to get that that you know, raw rock and roll sound. Uh, the, the Lazy Cowgirls, which are actually a male band. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, um, Steve. Runner asks, oh, wait, I've got another question. I'm sorry, Steve. Amy's question has to come first. Amy Prohaska asks, she said, hi, Clea, I haven't read the book yet, but as we all know, there are a bunch of characters in the Boston rock scene, past and present. Were any of them inspirations to the ones in your book? Good question. Uh, good question. Thank you, Amy. Um, Amy compiles uh, listings. Man, I think Amy is personally responsible for keeping uh, the club, the live music scene alive here in Boston. Um, get on her email list if you live in town. Um, nobody is anybody in particular. It's funny, I did a, um, an interview with Henry Santoro, who's now on GBH and all respectable, but I remember the days when he was at WFNX, our alternative uh, radio station, and you know he'd be playing, he'd be DJing at the clubs and then at these after parties afterwards. So we, before we did the interview, we talked for quite a while about, um, you know, he was saying, so is this that place? Is this, the, you know, it's like, no, that's not the channel. It's the rat and you know, back and forth. Um, but none of the people are anybody in particular. Um, everybody, you know, it's, it's, Caroline will, will back me up on this. Everyone I write is me, you know, um, <laughs> even, even, you know, the bad guys are me. Um, I use parts of people um, and that's really not a cop out. If I, if I actually, based anybody on somebody real that would have hindered me because you know right. you want them to be free to do whatever they're gonna do um and and to do what they want to do on the page and you know if i said oh this person is based on so and so it would be like I, I can't make her be a killer i know she lives in watertown and works as a doula now i mean you know that kind of thing <laughs> um so i you know i i borrowed i borrowed instance like like um like lisa seen the back of the band and, and you know and somebody else you know, leave unnamed, you know, going to rehab, um, you know, and, and another friend who was in band just talking about, about her, um, her bandmate you know, doing a lot of, doing a lot of heroin and the band falling apart. Um, but nobody is based on anybody. Um, that said, the fact that Boston and the Boston scene has so many characters, it did free me to create this character because I know that, that people, People can be who they want to be. People can reinvent themselves. And that's the other great thing about the rock world. You, Caroline, you asked about the, the rock world early on. Boy. This is a world where you could, you could, you could start over. You could, you could give yourself a name like, like Shred, like Oedipus. Um, and, and just, you know, you are no longer the, you know, the nerdy kid from Long Island. That's me, that's not Shred or Oedipus. Um, and, and just, you know, reinvent yourself. And feel. I mean, rock and roll is all about 
feeling. Yeah. Um, Steve Brunner asks, do you take inspiration from different places when writing cozies versus thrillers? You sort of answered that before, but this is a different side of it. Um, it is a good question though, and thank you. Um, partly because I've written so many cozies now, um, I'm very focused on uh, the puzzle aspect of the cozy and partly because the cozies are series books. So I, I know the characters better, you know, and so I have to um, come up with new characters for each book because, you know, you need, you need new suspects, you need new friends, you need to keep things fresh. But I know those characters so well uh, that I'm not looking for that. So with a, a cat on the case, um, I was out walking uh, with, with John and, and trying to just work out a, a, you know, part of the crime I wanted to get at. And, and I think he said something like, well, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not a crime. And I realized I, you know, I, there was this way I could sort of invert things. And um, well, I, I don't want to give anything away, but I could, I could sort of twist things around. So for a cozy, I am looking at, um, I, maybe I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of the puzzle aspect of the plot, whereas this book was more about um, the, the, the mystery of the character. And I, I now actually forget what your question was. So I hope that answered it somewhat. <laughs> I think you answered it. Okay, we have, a, we have a question from Karen Slosberg. You write about the feeling of performing so well. Did it help being a musician, being in bands? I bet I know the answer. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and it did. And yes, I did take out, you know, as I mentioned before, I took out my bass and wow, I, I no longer have any chops. You know, if you don't play for 10 years, you, you don't have it anymore. <laughs> I mean, I can still read music, but I'd forgotten how, how heavy it was. And I actually, I did get to use that too, because when Gal, at one point she doesn't play for a while and she picks up her bass, um, she's, she's blown away by how heavy it is. It's like, yeah. And, and so that, I use that, but, but yeah, so just, and just holding it and, um, and touching the strings and just how you have to stand when you've got it strapped on. Um, yeah, that's all it's like sense memory. And then you see, I had that and that made it easier. I still had to find the words to describe it, but it made it easier to, to be there. Right. Okay. We have two more questions. Two last questions from Laurie Hoffman. You say, you, oh, this is a really good one. You say you wouldn't want to hang out with Gal. What character would you like to hang out with? <sighs> Honey, the cat who you see on two pages. <laughs> <laughs> um, having said that, I don't know. I, I, I was being unfair to Gal. Um, I, you know, I, I know Gal. You know, right. I, I, mm -hmm. I love Gal. Um, she's, you know, she's got her issues. And, and one thing about Gal is she's tremendously loyal to her friends. I think, I think Gal's, um, her defining characteristic is her loyalty, her love for her friends. I mean, one of the things that we didn't even get a chance to talk about this is, um, this is also about family of choice, which is another element of the rock world. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, women in particular, it's like, do you choose to uh, have children and focus on that way or, or do you not? And Gal took a certain career path and her family is the family that, the family that she's chosen. And she's, you know, well, the fact that she's come back to town to play a memorial for this, you know, this woman who she, you know, she loves, loved, um, you know, gives you an idea of her dedication and the fact that she'll, she's throwing herself into trying to save you know, her friend's widower and her friend's daughter. Um, says something, but at the same time, um, because she is so damaged and because she's been so much, she, she also has to come to terms with the fact that she's hurt these people she loves so much. Um, I, I guess, so I guess in a, a, a I hope lesser way, I, I really do relate to Gal. So yeah, besides Honey the Cat, I think it would, I think it would be Gal. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can hang out with both of them. Nell Pepper has another question. What defunct Boston club do you miss the most? For me, it's uh, the Boston Tea Party. The rat. Oh, the I rat. was a rat girl. Because <laughs> the rat, the rat you, I mean, it was like, it, it just where you, you hung out. And partly because there was the, the, the main floor and the upstairs, which sort of became its own hang, you didn't have to pay a cover. So you just went there. It would be like, okay, who's playing? You know, and, and you went to other, we went to other places to hear bands like, oh, you know, the, 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 the liars are playing so-and-so, the Bristols are playing so-and-so, the, the throwing muses are playing so-and-so. But, you know, the default was go to the rat. Even if you went to the rat, had a beer and was like, oh, the, the, the set's playing at, uh, at uh, Storyville. It's starting at 10. Okay, we have time to finish this and get over there. Um, 
Okay, last question. Last question. Well, first, Amy says I missed the rat too, and Alan says the channel. Okay, so last. The channel was a hole, though. Man. Okay, sorry. <laughs> this is from Deborah. You said your first drafts are quick and sloppy. What's your approach to editing? Is it harder or easier for you than the first draft? That's interesting. Um, well, it's like pulling the pins out of your eyes. Uh, <laughs> I oh yeah I, I hate revising. Um, it's easier because you have something on the page, and I mean that's something that you know, Caroline and I, John and I, you know, we are always telling us like just get something on the page. You can't revise what isn't there. Just right. get it, you know, bash it out now, tie it up later. Um, but at the same time, you know, the, the fun and the rush is often in in the the writing that first draft and revising is hard. Um, and you know, so I guess it goes like the first part is great and it's fun. And then going back to it, it's like, oh my God, what was I thinking? This is miserable. It's never going to work. Um, and then, you know, maybe by when you finally, like by the, I don't know, the sixth or the eighth or whatever revision, you start going, oh, this is okay. This, this might work. It's a totally different thing. So I want to thank you so much, Clea, for thank being you. here. It's like, I miss you. We're friends and I miss you. I wish we didn't have just virtual. Listen, I want to thank everybody else for coming here. I want to thank the wonderful Harvard Bookstore. And I want to encourage everyone. There are links in the chat where you can buy Clea's books. And there's also an event schedule that you can see too. And I want to thank Audrey from the, let's stop. <laughs> I want to thank Audrey from the farm for the Harvard Bookstore um, for being such a wonderful host. And this is Clea's wonderful book. And thank you all. Thank you so much. Yeah. Clea, any final words on your fantastic book before we close out tonight? Wow. Um, I don't know. I, I, I thank you. Thank you all. Um, <laughs> I, I hope I hope you'll take this trip, trip with me. I, I hope I didn't give too much away. I hope I whet your appetite. And I want to hear what you think. So, you know, I'm on all the social media. If you read the book, let me know. Honestly, I, I want to hear. So thank you. Everybody thank saying you. thank you, thank you, thank you in the <laughs> chat. And John, hi, John is saying copies are still available at Harvard Bookstore. Oh, yes. I am signing tomorrow. So if you buy one tonight, I will personalize it for you tomorrow. Yeah. If you put in your order, we'll sign, have them signed tomorrow. There will also be signed copies on the floor if you don't get your order in right on time. There we have more on order, so more are coming. Um, thank you so much to everyone who is tuning in tonight and showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and the incredible staff at Harvard Bookstore. We really appreciate your support. We couldn't keep doing these events without knowing people would be watching. So we're grateful to have you here. Clea, Caroline, thank you so much for giving your evening and spending time with us is a fantastic time it's a fantastic book again check out the links in the chat if you would like to purchase a copy of hold me down you won't regret it it's fantastic from all of us at hover bookstore have a great halloween and have a great rest of your night take care everybody thank bye -bye. you so much thank you so so much bye